So now I'd like to move on to item 8A, which is a presentation by Police Chief Roger Pullman and Detective Keegan Quinn on human trafficking. Thank you both for coming. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners and uh, Councilwoman Boss. Uh, this is an important topic to important us topic. because it's one that is highly overlooked and a lot of people fail to understand. Uh, just a little bit of the numbers uh, before I turn it over to Officer or Investigator Quinn for the PowerPoint is the FBI has identified the Twin Cities areas as the 13th uh, as one of 13 U.S. cities with a particular high incident of child trafficking, child prostitution. And in 2015, Minnesota had the third highest number of human trafficking cases in the United States. So our uh, close proximity to the Twin Cities uh, also means that some of that could be taking place right here in the city of Red Wing. Also, the Department of Public Safety puts on an annual report, and the most recent report I could find on human trafficking was for 2018 that reported the 2017 numbers. Law enforcement agencies identified 21 labor trafficking victims. Service providers identified 394 labor trafficking victims. Law enforcement conducted 21 labor trafficking investigations, making two arrests. Prosecutors filed four labor trafficking charges and attained one conviction. Law enforcement agencies identified 401 sex trafficking victims. Service providers identified another 2,124 sex trafficking victims. And law enforcement identified sex trafficking investigations. Prosecutors filed 96 trafficking charges and convictions. Also, 51% of labor trafficking victims are men or boys. 91% of the labor trafficking victims were people of color. And 59% of sex trafficking victims were women. And 25% were girls under the age of 18. 69% of the sex trafficking victims were people of color. Uh, this is something that I've had my entire department uh, attend some training on, on signs to recognize uh, trafficking, uh, because otherwise it could happen right under your eyes. You could see it at a local convenience store and not even realize what you're witnessing. And then we've also uh, sent Investigator Quinn off to different uh, training opportunities. In fact, last, I think it was last fall, he assisted St. Paul uh, in some of their uh, sex trafficking um, cases that they were working on. So we're grateful to have his knowledge in our department. And I guess I uh, would like to turn it over to him. He has a PowerPoint for our uh, Safe Harbor group. And, uh, and uh, he chaired that committee. In fact, we were the first ones to come out the Goodhue County Safe Harbor Group was the first ones to come out with a guidebook in the state of Minnesota and possibly even a nation, I think they said. So congrats to him and his team that he worked on with that. It was a multidisciplinary team involving law enforcement agencies throughout the county, social services, public health, uh, and we're grateful uh, for the collaboration with everyone. So with that, I'll turn it over to Investigator Quinn. Hi there, everyone. Um, am I able to share my screen at this point? Oh, all right. Let me get this lined up. Okay. Um, as the chief said, I am Detective Keegan Quinn. I have worked uh, for the city of Red Wing as a police officer since 2005, and uh, it's something I enjoy doing. Um, currently assigned to the Minnesota um, Southeast Minnesota Violent Crime Enforcement Team and primarily investigate narcotics and violent crimes. I'm also the chairperson for the Goody County Safe Harbor Protocol Team. At any point uh, during this, and I, and I understand you guys have a lot of topics you want to cover tonight, um, I'm going to try to uh, go through this um, as thoroughly but as briefly as I can. So if you have any questions during this, feel free just to shout out. Um, 
because as I'm looking at the screen here, I can see my PowerPoint and I can see like two or three of you. So just feel free to speak right up um, if you have any questions about things. Um, so uh, in 2011, Minnesota passed a safe harbor law. And the law as we know it uh, isn't just one statute, it's, it's a number of statutes, three or four, that actually encompass the whole idea of what safe harbor is. Um, the nuts and bolts of it essentially are that um, youth and uh, people under the age of 24 um, got arrested for prostitution when they have a person who is trafficking them or um, a pimp, somebody else who's profiting a third party. Um, so as the years went on, the law progressed and more services were rendered to those people. Um, Minnesota adopted a no wrong door policy, essentially saying that um, at any point a person who is being victimized enters the system, whether that's through law enforcement or medical or advocacy, um, any, anything like that, that they will be channeled into um, services that they can use uh, and that they rightfully need. Um, let's see. As the chief said in 2018, our group, the uh, SMART team, the uh, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary group for Goody County uh, applied for and received funding for this. And we are the first team in the state um, to actually have a written plan. Now, uh, we're proud of that, but we did not invent this wheel. Um, there's a lot of people that came before us that we uh, leaned on heavily to achieve this um, protocol. The idea of the protocol is a centralized hub of information for all the people that um, need it, that they can look quickly and at a moment's notice, find out what they need to do when they encounter people uh, who are being trafficked. And it is being rolled out here this year. Um, if it weren't for COVID, we would have already had uh, multiple trainings on this uh, offered as our department. Um, for law enforcement in Goody County. I know that Health and Human Services also had stuff that they had to put off essentially because of um, of COVID. So it's been kind of a struggle there, but assured that we are rolling out this protocol to everyone who needs it. Um, and essentially what that means is that everyone who can provide services or that needs to be able to provide services will have all the information they need to, to, um, to do that. Um, some of our representatives here, as you can see on the screen, we have uh, everyone from advocacy to uh, medical staff, law enforcement, we have treatment facilities, we have some schools. Uh, obviously the Hope Coalition was, was big in this. Um, everything's kind of right there, but there are also a lot of um, representatives who are not on here, people who provided information from other, other agencies. So we appreciate their services as well. Um, <clears throat> you guys can read, but uh, some of the stuff I want to touch on here is uh, our vision. The Goody County Safe Harbor Protocol Team um, focuses on prevention, intervention, and responses, providing services of at-risk individuals. Um, the term victim survivor, and I'm not sure um, of our audience how, um, how much training experience that people have had with that, but I'll just touch on that quickly, is that um, that you'll see throughout the slides here, and if you ever see our protocol, um, you'll see the term victim survivor because um, everybody who is involved with this is cognizant, being uh, trauma informed, that uh, the people who are being trafficked, they are the experts of their lives. They are the experts of their experiences. And some people would prefer not to see themselves as victims, but uh, as survivors. And. Um, so that's why throughout this you'll see victim survivors. It's not because we couldn't make up our mind. It's, it was a conscious choice because we choose to let people um, see themselves how they want to be seen. Um, our core principles being victim-centered, trauma-informed, um, youth-centered, because predominantly Safe Harbor, the law started off as um, you know helping youth who would otherwise be uh, arrested or seen as delinquent misfits. Um, Kind of changing the script on that so that um, clearly they are victims they're being victimized they have little or no ability to control some of the situations that they're in um, so being youth-centered is, is big in this um, strength-based because everybody who is involved everybody every uh, victim survivor um, has a set every person on earth has a set of strengths that they can bring uh, to the table and of course being culturally responsive 
So what is human trafficking? Um, we've all seen movies, uh, TV shows who would, uh, you know, depict different types of scenarios. And uh, oftentimes uh, in, in action movies, you, you know, you might see or criminal minds, you know, TV shows, you might see this as being a shipping container full of people. Um, and sometimes that can be true, but most often a uh, majority of the people who are being trafficked uh, are from rural areas and uh, average people that you'd see on the street, walking down the street that you wouldn't necessarily perceive initially as being, uh, as being trafficked or being taken advantage of even. Um, but it has to do with um, essentially their life experiences that make some people more um, susceptible you know, more at risk for, for being trafficked. Um, human trafficking, when one person obtains or holds another person in compelled service. As the chief said earlier, um, you know, 21 million adults and children have been trafficked. Um, there's different types of trafficking, uh, sex trafficking, labor trafficking. A lot of the stuff that, uh, that we've seen, and, and I have seen some cases down here in Goodyear County, um, city of Red Wing, um, mostly involve sex trafficking. Uh, predominantly people that I've come into contact with are uh, people who have addiction problems that uh, essentially through survival sex have been able to provide shelter, um, food, and narcotics, things like that. Um, I can get into more of those terms if, if you guys would like later. Um, you know, feel free to answer or ask any questions as I go along. Um, Ninety-eight percent of those victims are women, but uh, a new study that came out here, and I was just talking to our regional navigator, Andrea White, um, <clears throat> that a uh, new study out of high schools is that it's actually almost 50 percent uh, boys and girls that uh, are being victimized, and it's kind of split right down the middle uh, for those high school age kids that are willing to participate in these, um, these types of studies. So it's kind of interesting now that I think with more education that goes out to the public, um, the more willing people are to listen, and, and honestly, the more willing people are to ask questions uh, of, of folks that who, who could be being trafficked or who are at risk. Average age, 12 to 14, um, of juveniles who are prostituted. So sexual exploitation is, again, like I said, one of the um, kind of the main focuses of what we've seen uh, down in our area. Uh, in our region, since 2014, the Southeast region has helped over 500 victim survivors um, into services of some level. Um, I know that in the state of Minnesota, in the last two years, they've seen uh, about a thousand, a little under a thousand people have been identified as victim survivors who've received services. So it's pretty widespread. It's more uh, more of a problem, I think, than a lot of the general public realizes. And if you think about it, in, since 2014 to now in our southeast region, uh, 500 people is a lot. That's a lot of people who are not being victimized just once, but repeatedly. Um, sex, sexual exploitation, exchange of sex and food for shelter and safety. That's survival sex. That's what I referenced earlier. Um, oftentimes exchange of money for sex or drugs. Sometimes this involves prostitution, stripping, pornography, um, different levels of that. Of course, sexual abuse and assault is um, how this is done. There's one of our statutes. Um, essentially, the big part of uh, the second part of the Safe Harbor Law isn't just the fact that it decriminalized uh, some of the acts that used to be referred to as prostitution involving uh, juveniles or people under the age of 24. It also enhanced the penalties for uh, the traffickers, for the Johns, people that are hiring um, or taking advantage of victimizing uh, the people. Um, all those individuals involved with the actual victimization now could face um, stronger penalties. It gives us more teeth um, to attack the problem with. So you might be asking yourself or have asked yourself, <clears throat> what, what, is, what does trafficking look like? What do, what do the victims look like? And um, again, they, this is a short list. There's, there's many more of these now. They may or may not be any of these things. It may be one, it may be more of these things. Um, 
but what you have to know is that there's a whole series of circumstances in people's lives that lead them down a path. Um, and I understand later today you guys will be hearing about uh, ACEs, right? Um, understanding ACEs is important, and I have included a flyer uh, on that with the, uh, the documents that were uh, given for this meeting, but I'm not going to get into that too far, other than to say that um, people's life experiences oftentimes will bring them uh, into situations that make them more at risk to be trafficked. Um, so victims, they may be uh, hostile, they may be uncooperative. Um, they are going to be loyal and fearful of their, tra of their trafficker because um, they've been groomed that way. A lot of times a trafficker who finds a person who's at risk will um, essentially get their hooks into them through nothing more than kind words. They might say things like, um, you, are, you are so beautiful. Has anyone ever told you how special you are? And it, it sounds silly to say that out loud and to hear that, but for some people, they may never hear kind words like that. They may never hear uh, positive and uplifting comments uh, in their life. And, and it may take just that little nudge then to get them thinking, you know what, this person's pretty awesome. They're pretty cool. They care about me. And once that relationship gets nurtured, and then the trafficker will oftentimes start taking away their support system, you know, cutting down people in their lives that they identify as a threat to essentially the product that they're trying to make and trying to groom, the victim. Um, and so they'll isolate them from, from their family and from their friends, and so they essentially become the only thing in the victim survivor's life. Um, that makes them feel safe, the only one that provides them with food and shelter and money and the things they need to get by. Um, so that makes them loyal. Um, sometimes these people are runaways. Sometimes uh, they're kids who struggle in school or that their home life may not be great. They could be boys, they could be uh, LGTB, um, they could be very young, oftentimes low functioning, um, otherwise delinquent. Um, they are people um, and, and, if, and if any of you guys have uh, talked to counselors in schools or teachers or uh, school resource officers, you know, a lot of times they can pick them out of the crowd too, kids who um, you know, are at risk for, for being victimized and really just need, um, I guess, some positive reinforcement from an adult in their life, a positive interaction. Um, but all these things, when you, when you talk to people, I assure you that everyone I'm talking to right now You've seen these people, and you probably are thinking of someone right now who might be uh, you know, falling into this category of people who are at risk. And so I think one of the biggest things, if, if you guys don't remember anything else from this presentation, just remember that you can ask questions. You can ask them, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? How's your home life? You know, Tell me about your day. Things like that, starting a conversation um, is good. It doesn't matter who they are, who you are, you know, uh, talking to people in a nice, polite manner, uh, you can't, oftentimes can't go wrong. So starting that conversation and asking questions about how they are, um, you'd be surprised what people tell you. And the more rapport you build with, with somebody, the better chance you might find out that they're being victimized in some way. Um, other victim in indicators. Um, when you're with these people and you see a younger person or a person who is clearly at risk of being uh, victimized and they are with an, a significantly older person or a person who uh, clearly is very slick, um, this person may refer to their, uh, this, uh, the victim may refer to this person as boyfriend or daddy or uncle or um, another name that might make you think, yeah, it makes sense that you're with them because it kind of justifies why this older person's with this younger person or something like that. Um, you might notice overbearing relationships and uh, controlling, what appears to be controlling techniques from people, um, whether that uncle or daddy or friend, older friend, might be holding onto the victim's IDs or um, if you interact with them, that older person might be the first person to speak in the conversation to kind of answer questions for the younger person. Um, sometimes the victims, they'll lack eye contact or um, they'll look to show they're not taken care of. Um, if you interact with them alone and, you know, or if your kids you know, you know, or your neighborhood kids are there and they have large amounts of cash that seem kind of funny, um, you know, things like that. It's all stuff to watch out for, but, um, it's a short list there. 
Along with the materials that I provided for this, I put uh, a parent's guide um, in there. And so I'm not sure how that works digitally if, if uh, people in the general public need a copy of that, if they can contact you guys. But feel free to disseminate that um, parent's parental guide for human trafficking to as many people as uh, want it, because we need as much information out there as possible. Um, so having taken up um, probably more than enough of your time, uh, there's my contact information. And um, I'm available for any questions if you'd like, either by phone or email or in the next few minutes before you guys move on. And I'm going to work on unsharing my screen here. Thanks, Keegan. And while they're thinking of their questions or maybe thinking of unmuting themselves, uh, I would like to just, just say, too, that the legislature uh, has done great work in trying to help law enforcement with the tools and the codes and statutes that, that allow us to better help the young people in need. Um, as it was stated earlier, uh, anybody under the age of 18 in the state of Minnesota involved in prostitution is now considered a victim of trafficking. Uh, and that's a, that's a key, key piece of us being able to help them. Of course, a lot of them, because of their lifestyle, uh, don't trust the system. So trying to build that rapport as law enforcement is uh, something that we work hard to try to do. And if nothing else, just plant the seed in them that, you know, hey, we're here for you. If you ever need help down the road or if you see so-and-so, uh, let us know. So, uh, and then also the legislation passed a couple years ago requiring hospitality businesses, all the hotels have to have their staff trained. So that's another critical piece of recognizing this when it comes in. So uh, I guess I, if I had one ask for the Human Rights Commission, it would be to help share the information and help us get the word out on this, uh, this um, crime that's taking place in our community because the more people that are aware of it, the more people that question it, the more people we can help because this is our future youth that need to know we care about them and that there is another way. So thank you for your time tonight. Yes. I think Julie's having problems. So just until she gets back on, Beth, you had a question. Hi. Um, yeah, I had a couple of questions. Um, I know you mentioned about the training me um, with some of the organizations, but are you going to reach out eventually to some of the other organizations to the smaller groups? Um, for instance, like the other group that I'm also involved in, the Red Wing Area Homeless Shelter Committee. I know some of us have gone through some of that training. I've gone through some of the Tubman training, um, but there are some people I know that should probably have some of that training. Um, will eventually after, I mean, I know once some of the other things settle down a little bit, will you be able to reach out to some of the other organizations to probably get this going? The Goody County um, Safe Harbor Protocol team has uh, a wide variety of partners who are willing to train just about anybody who wants it. We want to get the word out there. And so um, if you know of a group or you're part of a group that wants training, if you um, go ahead and email me, um, you definitely can, uh, we can. I can help you arrange and coordinate anything that uh, would be helpful for you guys, whether it's me or somebody from Safe Harbor or Regional Navigator's Office or uh, another team member, we can definitely facilitate that. Um, I've already done a number of trainings at smaller groups around um, and talks about this and kind of an awareness thing, but um, you know, with COVID, it's been a little more difficult. Thank goodness we have uh, you know, digital media like this that we can, that we can do these trainings at. But uh, yeah, feel free to reach out and we can coordinate anything you need uh, for whatever groups. And, and I can tailor some of this information to kind of be more helpful or less helpful depending on um, what you guys need. So. Uh, feel free to be specific about what you want to hear uh, and what aspects, and we can we can tailor some some talks and training. Jenny has a question. And my question, of course, in light of everything that's going on with COVID right now, and there are so many great ways that we're using technology to do things like this and still be able to meet. But of course, um, perpetrators of of exploitation and in, in a lot of different ways are also um, going to be continuing to use avenues like this. And so I'm, I was thinking about that, but also just thinking more broadly, um, if you have any specific 
concerns or things that you're kind of watching for within the increased maybe vulnerability and just where we're at as, as a community in a world right now within COVID related to traffic? Just curious. Well, like I said, um, you know, people who are at risk, um, leading a risky lifestyle, have a number of, of different avenues and, and different ways that they can be victimized. Uh, being online is risky for every single person who is online. There's so many ways we can be victimized without even knowing it. Um, but oftentimes I would say that if, if you're a parent um, and are concerned about it, your, your kids who have access to social media websites, you should have the passwords for those. You should be regularly checking those, those avenues for that. Um, if you are a guardian of a vulnerable adult, same thing there. You know, uh, any of your personal information on social media should be locked down as much as possible to be viewable only by your friends um, or people that you feel comfortable with. Um, a lot of that is, uh, unfortunately, we, I guess as a society, we need to be around other people. We need to interact with other people. And um, you don't want to shut yourself off from everybody and, and be sheltered away, you know, uh, from just about everybody. But you have to find a happy medium where you can interact with people, but do so in, in a respectful and, and at distance manner. So that, that'd be my advice is just making sure that if you if you have children or the guardian of a vulnerable adult and they are on social media, that you have passwords for their stuff and you actively monitor who they are interacting with and how they're interacting. And uh, I guess screen time is big too. If those people are always nose down on their computer or if you guys are nose down in your computers and phones and technology just remember that uh, human interaction one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, never go out of style that's it. they're always important to have AB, which is a um, presentation by maggie chihos and maggie is the child and family collaborative coordinator from goodyear county health and human services maggie's going to speak to us today on adverse child experiences or aces and what's happening in red wing regarding this issue wonderful thank you so much for having me here today can i share my screen i think you can perfect is a program of the Goodhue County Child and Family Collaborative. Um, the collaborative's goal is to work in partnership to build strong families and resilient children. So this is one way that we are working towards that mission. So just a little background about um, ACEs. So adverse childhood experiences were first studied in the 90s. Um, and what they really found through that initial study was that the more trauma and abuse and neglect that a person had during their early years, the more likely they were to have social and health problems throughout their lives. Um, so when this first came about, it was really seen as a landmark um, public health discovery. But for the most part, it has been unaddressed until recent years. So that original study identified 10 ACEs, and they fell into three categories of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. Uh, we know this is not a comprehensive list of all the traumas that someone experiences in childhood. Uh, leaving, living in extreme poverty can be a trauma living in a neighborhood uh, that has a lot of violence can be a trauma living through a pandemic can be a trauma um, so but this was the initial 10 that they studied so you may occasionally hear someone refer uh, to like their ace score so basically for every one of these things you would experienced in your childhood you would get a score of one so if you had experienced emotional abuse, that would be a one. If you experienced emotional abuse and sexual abuse, then you would have a two. 
They didn't take into account um, the number of times you'd been abused or experienced these things. Because if you had experienced it, you could, would get a number. So this is called the ACEs pyramid. And so what they found out is um, from the bottom of, their, of this pyramid here, you'll see the adverse childhood experiences. And they found that if you had experienced adversity in those early years, it really disrupted the way your brain developed. It changed your brain chemistry. Um, and that led to social, emotional, and cognitive adaptions. It led to the adoption of health risk behavior disease, disability, and social problems, and eventually early death. Um, some studies have shown that people that who have six or more ACEs have a lifespan of 20 less, 20 years less than people uh, who maybe just have zero or one ACEs. So since the initial study, uh, more work has been done in the field of epigenetics, and they've really uh, added in that bottom level of the pyramid about historical trauma. Um, understanding that there is a genetic component to trauma and how it uh, changes our genes and is passed down. So that there are some people who are born with a certain amount of trauma before their life experiences have even begun. So this is what I call the continuum of care. Um, starting with promotion and prevention, and then going all the way down to crisis intervention services. So at Goodhue County Health and Human Services, uh, we're usually more on the right side of this, of this continuum at the crisis intervention services. Um, so with this ACEs initiative, and what we're trying to do with this work is really trying to be more upstream on the promotion and the prevention end um, to both prevent ACEs from happening, as well as mitigate the effects of ACEs early on. So fewer people are getting down this continuum of care and fewer people need those crisis intervention services. So the CDC does estimate that um, each non-fatal case of child maltreatment costs the US economy over $800,000 um, over the lifetime of that child. So while of course there's moral reasons and public health reasons uh, to do this ACEs work, there's also a financial reason to it too. Um, the amount of money that is spent on everything from court costs to doctor bills uh, to loss of employment is a drain on our economy. So I wanna talk a little bit about what child maltreatment looks like here in Goodhue County. On average, we have about uh, 255 cases of child maltreatment per year. Uh, in 2019, that was 268 cases. Um, with COVID, overall statewide, child maltreatment reports are down about 50%. Locally, we're more down about 30%. Um, and what we know is that all of the risk factors for abuse and neglect are up, but our reports are down. Uh, economic insecurity, parental stress are risk factors for childhood abuse, but children are not seeing teachers, they're not seeing coaches, they're not seeing other mandated reporters, so those reports are down, um, but our, our belief is that, that the abuse is not going away, uh, it's probably up, so that is concerning. Um, kind of back to that initial ACEs study. So what they found out is the higher your ACE score was, or the more adversity you had experienced in your childhood, the more likely you were to have health and social problems. So much so it really was this direct dose response relationship. Um, there aren't too many things in health that have quite this direct line um, between with health outcomes and social outcomes. So this next graph is called an oil slick graph. And basically what it is saying is that whole kind of dark piece in the middle is what can be attributed to ACEs of all of those health and social problems. 
So if we could address ACEs, we could perhaps reduce 24% of cancer cases, 65% of cases of alcoholism, 41% of cases of depression. So by addressing ACEs and preventing ACEs, we really can have an impact on so many health and social problems. Um, the long lasting health impacts of ACEs has really even brought this as a priority to the CDC. Maybe less so now that we're in a pandemic, um, but they have, they have said this is a significant health problem that needs to be addressed. So the good news is that ACEs are uh, predictable. We know why they happen, we know how they happen, and what is predictable is preventable. And we all have a role in preventing ACEs and ensuring that kids have a great future. So the CDC has a lot of technical packages about how to address ACEs. Uh, and our group locally has really taken that and, um, and based our work on those strategies. So they lay out the six strategies you see on your screen. Um, the ones with the blue arrows by them are the four that we really focus on. Uh, but we also, we definitely, I think all six are, are part of our work. So we're kind of operating under two theories of change. Uh, there's a misperception of some of the social norms around child neglect and abuse. And so part of our goal is to use communications to correct those misperceptions and then hopefully change social norms. Um, also identifying that behavior that affecting our community and increasing benefits and lowering barriers uh, to behavior change through marketing strategies, which will hopefully lead to change behaviors. So what does that actually look like? We're really trying to have a paradigm shift in our community that when somebody, instead of saying what's wrong with you, when somebody has a behavior that we don't understand, that maybe instead we ask, what happened to you? How can I support you? Instead of labeling a child as destructive or uncontrollable, we understand that they have a difficulty self-regulating or that they were triggered by something. That instead of saying a child is choosing to act out, that maybe that child lacks the necessary skills to regulate their emotions and their behavior. Instead of saying that parents are lazy and don't want to parent, they don't know how to control their kids. Instead, we maybe recognize that parents are under a lot of stress and need support and skills. Also changing the thought of it's not my kid, not my problem that that community norm should be that preventing child maltreatment is everyone's responsibility, whether it is your child or not, whether you're a parent or not, whether you're a teacher or not. We all have a role in preventing ACEs. So how are we doing this? Um, so we have a local group. We have 11 trained presenters and we go to the, throughout the community to schools, um, We've done most of the county staff, uh, we've done a lot of different groups and train them, um, give them the information about ACEs, the brain science behind it, and then how we can build a resilient self-healing community. So currently we have trained over 350 people throughout Goodhue County. Um, our goal is to train a thousand people by August of 2021. We were well on our way to meeting that goal. Um, unfortunately, COVID has kind of thrown a wrench into that. Uh, we're not able to do, use our curriculum virtually, so we are looking for different avenues currently to keep the momentum of this work going. We're also doing um, public outreach campaigns. We use our social media accounts to share tips with how to connect with young people, um, we've also had billboards and bus ads you may have seen around town, really promoting the idea uh, that it is every adult's responsibility to connect with the child. And that one connection could be that connection that changes a child's life. 
We also really want to uh, show the movie Resilience, which is a documentary about ACEs and the science of hope. Um, and so we're hoping that when restrictions lift and it is okay to gather again, uh, that we will be able to have some community uh, showings of that film as well. We're also developing a person-centered trauma responsive toolkit. So this is going to be a library of resources, evidence-based programs, and other things that an organization, business, school can take to adapt to their organization to become more trauma responsive uh, and, and have that prevented and mitigation of ACEs in their organization. So also part of that is um, doing some, some consulting with these schools, organizations, and businesses. So being kind of that sounding board of what does this look like? How can we become more trauma responsive? So at the county, for example, we've looked at what do our intake procedures look like? How can we maybe be unintentionally re-traumatizing someone um, and how can we make some changes in our practices to make that a more welcoming environment for someone who maybe has experienced a lot of trauma. We also do a lot of advocacy about social emotional learning and the protective factors. So there are six protective factors that are proven that if they are in place, child abuse and neglect are much less likely uh, to happen. So those are nurturing and attachment, parental resilience, concrete supports, social connections, knowledge of parenting and child development, and social and emotional competence in children. Um, we really focused on the social connection. A big piece of what we have learned is it really all comes down to relationships. And if kids feel supported and parents feel supported, um, child abuse and neglect are so much less, more or less likely to happen. Um, so we have concerns that now in this time of pandemic, how do we keep kids socially connected and keep caring adults in kids' lives in a time when we have to physically distance? Um, so trying to figure out what, what does that look like? So really our goal, um, what we are working towards is building a healthy, resilient, trauma responsive community where we not only prevent ACEs from occurring, but we have organizations that are ready to respond and mitigate the effects of ACEs. And really instead of outcasting people in our community that may have certain behaviors because of abuse, we adapt and shift and understand to support them to be a contributing member of our community. And there, my email address is on there, so you're welcome to contact me with any questions or I'll, I'll take questions now too. I have a question, Maggie. Has there been any thought that um, for some of these people who are experiencing or reporting less trauma, that the added income that they are receiving has reduced some of the stress that they're under. Um, the added $600, I'm understanding, per week until the end of July. Has there been any thought that maybe with this less burden, financial burden, that it's like eased up on family stress? Um, I would hope so. We definitely know that concrete support, having those financial supports, being able to put food on your table and not worrying about paying your mortgage or your rent, that definitely does uh, you know, help reduce the chances of child abuse and neglect. I think we also have to look at um, having kids home all the time, not in school, not in daycare, kids trying to figure out distant learning, parents trying to figure out distance learning, um, you know, sometimes trying to still work and deal with all of that, but those really increase parental stress um, and stress among the kids too. And that is just not a great situation uh, for, these, for these families that struggle. Does anyone have any questions for Maggie? Well, Mark, has they, Mark, does Mark I didn't see your, I can't see everyone. Mark, great. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this summer, we're gonna find 
so much, you mentioned it, so much of the typical support that these students or these children have over the summer is not going to be there this year. Sport, obviously, beyond camp, the, the city's uh, park, swimming pool. You know, this is being done to kind of create uh, a pro, proactive environment and in some way, I work with community ed, and I know they're well there as well. It seems to me that we know the problem. How do we anticipate? How do we react? Yeah, I think that's a great question and something we are actively trying to figure out. Uh, it is our belief that kids need as much social support as possible right now. Um, but how do we do that safely in this time of pandemic? Um, you know, I personally believe that every child needs to be seen at least once a week by someone outside of their family, by another caring, competent adult. So how do we make that happen in this time of pandemic? That's a, that's a great question. Are there other comments or questions for Maggie? Well, this was great information, Maggie. We so appreciate you coming. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. I just want to backtrack. I, I suppose I was on mute when I was thanking Chief Pullman and Keegan for their presentation as well. Again, thank you so much for being willing to come and speak to us.